Hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Ask the Alliance by the Healthy Feet community, Healthy Feet Alliance. I have been trying to go live on Facebook and it did not work. So we're going to record this and just share it with you all. And uh, yeah, this is the constant struggle with social media and we're going to figure it out one of these days. In the meantime, we're going to, we have four amazing panelists that are going to answer the questions that you all shared with us. And before we do that, I want to invite um, each of them to introduce themselves. So please just, you know, say your name, where you're calling from, and what is your spirit fruit and why? What is your spirit fruit? What are you calling in today? What fruit is really, are you embodying today? <laughs> so we could do it in alphabetical order. Anya, go. Okay, so I am Anya, um, and I run the website Anya's Reviews, which is all about getting you into better footwear and how to find them for your needs, depending on what you're looking for. I also have an online e-shop for barefoot shoes and then a new website called barefootshoefinder.com. So my spirit fruit is, well, the fruit that I love the best is berries. And yeah. <laughs> All right, Anya, thank you. Golden. All right, hello everyone. I'm Golden Harper. Uh, I grew up uh, selling shoes starting at age nine. My family opened a, a shoe store and along with that came uh, fixing, you know, trying to help people fix their foot problems. By age 18, I realized it was all garbage and uh, went to college to try and figure out how to actually do that. And they don't really teach it there either. So, uh, but uh, it's been a lifelong journey of uh, that's brought me to natural foot health and foot care. And I uh, eventually uh, ended up founding Alter Footwear. Uh, I am now a foot health and running coach and uh, happy to be on here. And my spirit fruit is probably passion fruit because I'm, pa I'm all passion all the time. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, Paul. Hey guys, Paul Thompson. Um, social media is the Barefoot Podiatrist. I've got a podiatry clinic here in Australia um, called Coronal Podiatry and the Barefoot Movement. I help people get back on their feet and found their feet, get them out of orthotics and moving to the best of their ability. So you can check out the barefootmovement.com.au and my spirit fruit. I reckon tonight would have to be a pineapple. Got the, the crown <laughs> happening. <laughs> what do you reckon? We call it in. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Bring that king energy. Beautiful. That's it. <laughs> Ray. Ray McClanahan. I'm a sports podiatrist from Portland, Oregon. I've got a clinic here called Northwest Foot and Ankle. I'm very passionate about helping anybody that wants to be active to take care of their feet in a preventive fashion. I'm also the inventor of Correct Toes. I'm really grateful to be on this call and I'm really grateful to be a part of this group. I'd say my spirit fruit has got to be raspberries. All right. Thank you, Ray. And my name is Jeff. I have the page called The Urban Barefoot, which is an ever evolving exploration of what it is to be human, I suppose. And my spirit for right now is a galactic peach. I, we, I'm staying in this house and you know, I'm, I'm nomadic and we, there's these peaches that look like little galaxies. They're really cool. And that's, I'm feeling very galactic today. So, um, all right, we're just gonna dive in. And um, the first question, uh, is for Paul. And just because um, it's, you know, I call out one of you for the question doesn't mean that you're the only one who has to answer if anyone wants to jump in. But the question here is the best way to manage ongoing foot issues without surgery, Morden's neuroma and plantar fasciitis. Um, yeah, right. So the best way to manage them non-surgically is looking for the underlying dysfunction underlying problem you know normally in my clinic it's all about finding foot stability when there's a instability going on you normally loading an area incorrectly or putting too much stress through tissue um, that will often lead to symptoms like neuromas 
plantar fasciopathies, Achilles issues, knee issues, you name it, normally stems from poor movement patterns. So that's what we work on. We work on rebuilding healthy movement patterns, creating stability, getting people into appropriate footwear that will also help move more naturally and reduce stress through these parts of the body. That's kind of how I deal with um, with these sort of cases non-surgically. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, when they when they when you say managing, it makes me think you're uh, in pain or dealing with this right now. And uh, a, a lot of times in that situation, this is where I think getting your feet in their natural position all day, every day is really, really critical. Uh, and uh, for, for most people that are in a lot of pain, doing that in a shoe without any cushion can be really difficult. So that, that might be a place where uh, having some cushion in a shoe is gonna be helpful uh, as much as necessary to allow you to function while still keeping your foot in its absolute natural position, no heel elevation, no taper toe box. You should be able to wear correct toes inside the shoe, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think those things are critical. And then, you know, just like Paul said, work on building up these, uh, you know, the foot strength and the stability. And it can be as simple as go for a 30 second barefoot walk in your, in the grass in your front lawn and add 30 seconds every few days and, and see what happens from there. Uh, but, you know, you got to function all day, every day in with your foot in its natural position. It's so critical in this situation. Yeah. Also understanding that, uh, you know, plantar fasciitis is, is not a thing. Uh, you know, if you've had it for any uh, amount of time, it's plantar fasciosis or some sort of plantar fasciopathy. Uh, it is literally decaying, dying, degrading tissue. There's no inflammation there. So don't do all the typical treatments you read on the internet that are addressing inflammation because that's just a waste of your time. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big point. Yeah. So, you know, what I've noticed is that as I work as I walk barefoot more and work my feet more, they, they, they will hurt. There will be pain, right? There's the, just like working out any muscles, there is pain. It's important to distinguish what is the pain of progress and what is the pain of, of sort of um, deconditioning. Yeah. Mm. But it's also it's important to work out what's like, because a lot of these symptoms are just treated for the symptoms. You know what I mean? And like, same as like managing neuromas or like, sure, you need to look at the diagnosis, look at what's going on. But often the missing piece is not looking at like why that person's walking like wrong for a, for a better word. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So it's definitely what, what Golden said is getting into the right position, which then also helps facilitate, you know, better hip movement, better muscle activation through the whole body it's it's a holistic approach it's not just it doesn't it's not all at the foot you know i think sometimes we get stuck at that problem where the pain is rather than you know it's like we're looking where the smoke is rather than where the actual fire is hmm. honestly this group could spend 45 minutes on this question alone I, yeah, I <laughs> yeah i'm trying to keep it short I'm... <laughs> and, and we Me have too. probably the, the 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 four most suited individuals to have that conversation so yeah Anya I, you, I heard you were going to say something yeah I just wanted to add that um when like coming from a person who suffered chronic pain not as a medical professional but that when you have the those issues that tend to turn chronic then you're also not moving very much and you're not getting the blood flow to your extremities and getting those benefits and that that can perpetuate the chronic pain because just going or being active, just walking and especially walking barefoot or in minimalist shoes so that you're getting all of that blood to the affected areas is really critical. And for me, making that change was huge in just the pain part because it's, it's really neurological and it can become conditioned. So just getting that blood flow and then a lot of those symptoms for me. Yeah, thank you. Huge. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are a few things more valuable than the perspective of someone who's been sick and healed themselves. You know, that's, it's such a, it's so important to, to have that perspective. And, and yeah, like there's, there's nothing more valuable than someone who's gone through it for, for me. Um, yeah. Is there anything more to add? 
I'd quickly say just look at your lifestyle as well. Sometimes I'll find, you know, like it gets deep, some of this stuff, but check your diet, check your stress levels, you know, check holistically what's going on. Cause it's just, it's weird how the body responds to lots of different inputs as well. So again, getting back to that holistic approach, just look at that lifestyle. Look if there's, if there's one foot playing up, look if there's something you're doing daily on that one foot. Um, you know, I had a bit of a niggle lately in my right foot and I couldn't work it out. I'm like, what's it like? This is just, I could not work it out until I realized that I've been pushing the pedal on my patient chair with that foot in this weird kind of way that I've been doing it. And I'll do that, you know, hundreds of times a day and realize I've just been just irritating this part of my foot by pushing this button in my foot. So now I've changed where the pedal is and foot pain's gone. So sometimes it's, you know, the answer's right in front of us. It. It's just a matter of having a look at the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And if all of that fails, we can look at the emotions behind it. Um, so, yeah, I've had some interesting cases of, of, of foot pain dissolving but um i'm I'm gonna leave that for another conversation and so there's a next question i want to keep moving here um this one's a bit long so bear with me here um this question is from at lucas underscore rlbg and it says does the transverse arch really exist i've been hearing it a lot lately uh that there isn't such a thing and the industry is just promoting its existence and importance to sell orthotics are the structures that are said to build that arch even strong enough to do that and why do native people who've been barefoot their whole lives not have that arch ray this is for you yeah yeah i think it does exist at least anatomically um however depending upon who you talk to and who you talk with uh, some people say there's five foot arches. Some people say there's three foot arches. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but uh, the transverse arch does exist. I think it also exists in native populations that don't wear shoes. I, I lived in Africa for a period and it did appear that those people's feet are are flat. However, um, a, a potent observation has been made that their feet appear flat mostly because their intrinsic arch musculature is so much more developed than ours is. Um, so I, I definitely think it exists and whether or not we were able to build it, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think we probably should focus more on building the intrinsic, intrinsic arch muscles, um, which definitely is, is one of the most potent things that we can do for our, for our long-term foot health. It sounds like don't lose the forest for the trees. Indeed. <laughs> So kind of uh, related to the last question. Um, all right, I'm gonna move to this question which should stir up some uh, some debate here. Uh, Anya, what are the top five best sneaker options? <laughs> For what? <laughs> yeah. That's, so yeah. Sneakers, well, and just the five best is really gonna be different for everybody. Um, there you've got a whole range of widths and then also sole thicknesses. And then depending on what type of an activity, like whether it's just a casual sneaker or it's running like a ultra marathon. Um, so I would say that um, figuring out how, like what your foot needs are, you know, if you need some cushion, if you've been barefoot for a long time and you're needing the thin soles, then those are really important questions. Uh, we've got some really great sneakers by people who are in the Healthy Feet Alliance, Golden Ultra Sneakers, which I've reviewed and they're fabulous that have thicker soles, Zero Shoes, um, Wildling even has sneakers and those are basically socks with a little grip on the bottom. They are extremely minimal. I've been hiking in those and sometimes you step on a rock and it literally hurts through the sole of the shoe because there's just, it's basically no, nothing but a little bit of protection. Um, so in terms of what are the best, yeah, it's really hard to say, but as long as it meets the minimum requirements of natural, they're zero drop, they've got a foot-shaped toe box, no arch support, 
no toe spraying, those types of things, then, um, then you can start to think about what your other needs are. And if you're brand new, then you might not want to go towards something like the Wildling Nebula, which is their running shoe, because that might be a bit uh, too much at once. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. It's a non-answer, um, but I've covered a lot of those options um, on my website. So I'm really familiar with sneakers, like a, very, very familiar. Um, and there's so many great ones and they're all so different, so. Yeah, uh, I would just add that it really comes down to uh, how strong are your feet, where are you at in your progression right now? Uh, you know, if your feet are, are really weak and hurting, uh, you're probably going to want to go with something with more cushioning, uh, a little bit more thickness, uh, and offset that with something without any um, or true barefoot times. Um, you know, but those are going to be in in very big proportions of time you're spending time in more cushioning, less time you're spending in barefoot, and over time you're going to be able to phase in more and more barefoot or more and more minimal uh, type shoes with no cushioning. Uh, and then it depends on your activity. You know, uh, there's there's times where a highly cushioned shoe might be excellent for an activity like an ultra marathon. Mile 90 of an ultra, uh, you know, you're gonna be hard pressed to be out there in a, uh, you know, a, a truly minimal non-cushioned shoe. Some people, very few can do it, um, but it, it is also, you know, risky or, or you might not be prepared. It's hard to, it's hard to prepare your feet for something like that. So really activity is dependent. I can just tell you as somebody who uh, runs really long distances, does a lot of high impact sports, uh, but also has really strong feet and goes barefoot the majority of my day, um, that I use a wide, wide variety of options from you know well-cushioned ultras to uncushioned or, or lower cushioned ultras to uh, lems to Vivo barefoots uh, to zero shoes. Uh, you name it, you know, and I employ all of those in, in, you know, my weekly uh, use, I guess, of footwear. So uh, there's, there's a lot of options out there, not as many as we would like. Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to find what works for you. And again, it comes down to how strong your feet and how, you know, how ready are you and how I how a high impact and how long is the activity you're doing as well. And one one other thing that I wanted to add that um, I've discovered is pretty important for people trying to find footwear is to actually consider other aspects of their foot shape and their foot type. Like, for example, Vivo Barefoot has a bit of a narrower um, shape. It doesn't mean that they're tapered. They're not tapered. They allow the big toe to lay straight. But if you have a really wide foot, then... <laughs> Or in really high arches, Viva tends to fit really snug over the top of the foot. And so it's really thick feet. You know, another thing to think about, like LEMS, for example, and Ultra, they tend to be better for people whose feet are really tall this direction. Um, and then there's a whole host of brands that can accommodate like super, super wide feet, like Soft Star has a primal range. Yeah, run <laughs> those things, I mean, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but the point is that everybody's foot is unique and it's also strength and shape and size and um, activity. And so once you start to think about that, then it helps you narrow down the options to the ones that are will work. Yeah, ideally everyone would have their local cobbler that could make them something custom. And, you know, what, what is amazing to me is that you know, when I, when I started looking into this, not even that long ago, there were not so many options or at least not so many options that I knew of. And they just keep growing. And it's so amazing to see this expanding and to see that, you know, that, that there's sort of a collaboration happening, even, you know, within this group and just, you know, th through the industry that, that it's growing and that, that everyone's working together to, to try to keep moving this forward. And I think that's, you know, really what we're here for right now in this conversation and, and what the world could really benefit from, you know, having a, a different conversation about footwear than what we see in the mainstream. So yeah, this is a, a, a hard question to answer, but a, a, and a very meaningful discussion. So um, let's uh, move on here to the next question um, 
for Ray again. Uh, the question is, my father is 63 years old and has and with a lifetime hallux valgus in both feet. He thinks there's nothing to do because he is too old and the doctor says there's no hope for him. Can I help him and how? Yeah, very, very likely you, you will be able to help him. Um, sadly, too many people think that there's nothing to do for bunions, hallux abducto valgus, other than an operation. And, and un unfortunately, too many people believe that. Um, there's one situation where you might not be able to help your father, and that would be if he's not able to get his big toe to go back into its natural position. But if you can actually manually reduce his big toe back into natural position, he could definitely benefit from a toe spacer. Um, the other thing that you want to speak with your father about is his footwear. Um, too many people don't really understand that most of the footwear that's available for consumers will hold their toe in a bunion configuration. So if he has range of motion to be able to reduce his big toe into a straight position, and if he can see his way to finding footwear that will allow his big toe to be straight so that he can wear a toe separator, very definitely um, it's not too late. Uh, a lot of people believe that and sadly too many podiatrists and too many orthopedic surgeons tell people that there's only one option and that is surgery and that and that's a absolutely false um, we've got a bunch of videos on our site correctos.com uh, we've got rehab uh, exercises to do for bunion uh, but definitely uh, instill instill some optimism and hope in your father and certainly have him reach out to our clinic if there's anything we can do to help him reverse his bunions and I'll just add to back Ray up here. I've got I've got a neighbor uh, in the same situation, pretty serious hallux valgus, uh, pretty serious bunions, uh, and uh, also neuroma pain, uh, also very serious, very debilitating for her. And uh, we got her in some correct toes uh, and told her the goal was to get to the point where she could wear them all day, every day, and that she would slowly have to build up to get there. Uh, and also replaced her shoes uh, with a pair of ultras that leave her foot in its natural position that were the same cushion level and support level as she was used to, um, but just now without heel elevation, without a tapered toe box, and just told her, wear the correct toes in those shoes, go barefoot when you can, as long as there's no pain, uh, and, you know, slowly strengthen. And honestly, within uh, within a few days, uh, the neuroma was uh, almost, almost pain-free. Uh, several weeks later, pretty much pain-free altogether. And she's functioning very, very well. And, you know, uh, I've seen enough times over the last, you know, 10, 12 years to know that if she continues to wear the correct toes all day, every day, that her feet will go back into position or will become much more functional. So uh, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Ray said. I've, I've seen it happen too many times. Yeah. I'll just say to back right up as well. <laughs> I have correct toes in the clinic and I've tried a lot of different toe spaces and I still get Ray to send me the correct toes over for the clinic to Australia from the States because I find they are, they're the ones I wear, um, patients that I have love them. And we see all the time, same thing, like what Golden and Ray said, like we see changes in the forefoot all the time. It's a matter of, you know, obviously wearing them like at the appropriate times, um, having the right range of motion, but doing the exercises as well to help maintain the new position and get muscles firing. But yeah, correct toes all the way. <laughs> so I want to actually ask a question because it's something that comes up uh, in my mind when I think about correct toes. And, you know, the, the, what, what, we, what we talk about all the time is that orthotics are um, sort of immobilizers and they you know, keep our foot in a certain position, locked in a certain position. And, you know, it, theoretically, correct toes do the same thing right? They keep your foot in a certain position. And so I want to kind of dig into the distinction between, you know, an orthotic and, and something like correct toes or, or any toe spacers. So just, you know, tease that out. Um, and that's not a question on here, but I think it's a really important um, discussion. Yeah, same. I get that question all the time. And often I'll tell people, you know, orthotics are uh people often rely on an orthotic you know it's like it's an aid to 
help them uh, like get out of pain or to help prop up the arch. But a lot of the times you then don't try and strengthen that arch to stay there. You know, man, it's just like it's there to actually support it. Where the way I use correct toes is it's more of an aid rather than an orthotic. I mean, if you want to call it an orthotic, that's fine. But it's not about relying on it. It's more about getting into that position that it's stretching those toes, like aiding a better position and then moving the foot in that better position to activate the muscles that then help hold the toes there. Like I see changes in people's feet where eventually they can have those toe spaces off and still maintain good toe splay, good intrinsic you know, muscle function of the foot. Whereas the orthotic doesn't tend to do that it tends to kind of weaken structures and people tend to rely on them more to actually function in. All right, you might want to jump in, Ray, and, and give your opinion on that as well. I, I totally agree with you, Paul. Um, the way I describe it is, well, exactly as Paul stated, an orthotic is actually doing something to the foot that the foot should be able to do for itself. If you put, like Paul said, if you put the toes in their proper uh, orientation, then the arch muscles can actually do for it for a person's foot what an orthotic would do so yes in a sense it is it is an orthotic but the way i describe it to folks is it's an orthotic that's teaching you to do something that's natural which is to support your own arches as opposed to doing something artificial and unnatural by putting something up under the arch and and to paul's point also it's not intended for lifelong use it's intended to cue your brain to have that relationship with your feet so that your arch muscles do what they're intended to do and eventually learn your way out of it, you know, learn, learn how your feet are supposed to function so that you're not reliant on anything, anything artificial. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, it seems more like a challenge to challenge your foot to, to, re, to relearn how to, how to use itself rather than to, make it you know sit on the couch every day um yeah anya yeah i was gonna say one thing about correct toes is that when you have them on you it's not like your foot is fixed you know you can wiggle your toes even back and forth in between in the little space that the correct toes gives you it's they're not restrictive um so and that's something that's unique about correct toes and the main reason why i also promote them as well because they're not like binding your feet they're not they're not holding them they are holding the toe the feet out but they're not making it so that you can't wiggle your toes and things like that so uh, yeah just wanted to throw that in there yeah thank you um so we'll we'll keep going here um and it's kind of related maybe we'll just go through this quickly how to help friends rehabilitate their aching feet after wearing supportive shoes for too long i think we kind of already covered that with take your shoes off <laughs> with, yeah just yeah I, if you want to help your friend you got to get in there and massage and mobilize and <laughs> you know, do all the hard work for them or make them you know do something for themselves and you know i always talk to people about like when our feet get slack Right, if you're stuck in a shoe for too long, like a supportive shoe, your feet get slack. And then slack becomes an acronym. The right word, an acronym? It's late here. Um, so each of those letters is what's going to help you actually rediscover and rebuild a functional foot. So S is strength. L is length or mobility. So you want strength, length, alignment. All right, that's where like your correct toes come in or different sort of drills where you're working on building alignment get the foot re-engaged then we want control so you want to control that strength length and alignment and then k is keep it up you've got to maintain this stuff <laughs> otherwise you're going to go back to your feet sitting on the couch like jeff said before <laughs> so if your feet are slack strength and length and align control and keep it up i hadn't heard that acronym it's really it's a it's a great awesome one. yeah it's copyrighted right here <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah. I use it in workshops all the time. People like it. It sticks in their brain. <laughs> it works great. Uh, 
So uh, this is this is kind of related I, I, in my perspective, and I, it, this question was assigned to me, so I'm just going to dive in. And the question is, how can I get involved in the foot movement? And there, I think there's there's two ways to view this. It's like, how can I get involved in like getting my feet healthy? But more importantly, that, uh, this sounds like a question about like the the barefoot movement, the movement that we're all participating in to help shift the perspective on 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 feet and footwear and for me for me you know how, how to get involved is to just start talking about it to start asking questions to start conversations with anyone that you come in contact with about about you know what what is going on with our feet why don't we talk about it more why do our shoes not look like feet why do they look like torpedoes uh, why, you know, just start to ask these questions, like go, you know, when you're at dinner with a group of friends, just like ask weird questions about, about footwear and about feet and, and see what happens. I think this is what the, the most important and the, the sort of best way to get involved is to start to have more conversations about it so that we can actually start to build awareness. And also if you're, um, a documentary film director, please call us if you are um, an event producer or have any big conferences or any of those things. Um, reach out to the Healthy Feet Alliance so that we can bring our amazing uh, executive members to come and give talks or um, yeah, invite us on, on your podcasts or anything like that. Um, I think the more we talk about it, um, the more that change can happen. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any other. I think it's really grassroots, you know, um, and it, it starts with home, you know, like work on your family first. And I, I've just told my neighbors, I'm like, when your feet start to hurt, come talk to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, every one of my neighbors uh, now has altars um, <laughs> on all sides <laughs> of my house and, and other natural footwear, frankly. And uh, a lot of it often just stems with, you know, something's, something's not quite right. And I've let them know, like, look, uh, this is what I do. Uh, and if something's not quite right, come talk to me. And the thing is, once you get people in natural footwear and get their feet functioning again, they will tell other people because it helped them. And I just remind them, like, you know, this helped you. So now find other people in your life that it can help. And it spreads like wildfire. It's all grassroots. It starts small. It starts at home. It starts with your neighbors and then let it grow out from there. Uh, you know, and for me, it's just like, I make it simple, like, hey, 99% of all shoes deform your feet. They take your foot out of its natural foot position, and then things can't work right. When do you need our support? Whenever you wear a pair of traditional modern footwear, that, that's 99% of all shoes, elevate your heel, they bend your big toe in, which makes it incapable for your arch to actually support itself. And then that, you know, a whole host of problems begins from there. Let's get a reset, people. Um, and, you know, again, I try to meet people where they're at, you know, wherever you happen to be at, whatever your, you know, kind of cushion or support level is that you're at, I try to meet them right there and then help them as their feet get stronger, they can go to less and less cushion or less and less support over time. Um, but it, it works really well. And that's the thing, just let it, let it spread. That's probably the best way is because when you get a powerful conversion, they're going to be, uh, those people are going to be passionate about helping other people as well that they know. And, you know, I think it's, it, it's about asking more questions than having answers because there's some, yeah, I mean, it, the answers, like, it's pretty obvious that what, what we're doing, is not working with feet, you know, all the injuries and the pain and the problems, the podiatrists are loving it because they have a lot of business, but, you know, is it really, <laughs> is it really what, uh, well, you the podiatrist laugh. I mean, I, yeah, I was, I, I, I owned the podiatry business and, and I was asking these questions. And when I, when it became very clear to me, I said, oh my God, like we, nobody, not enough people are talking about this and we have to, I have to do this, right. I have to do this for my community. I have to start um, spreading the word. And, and it, it was like a, a discovery process that I was just sharing uh, through this, my social media and then that just kept growing somehow and and yeah my passion really fueled me to keep you know sharing more and now i you know i just walk barefoot everywhere and i i just i'm i'm i just have my fingers crossed that 
people will like come and like ask me something and and that will yeah, we can spark a conversation and and yeah so that's um it's, this is yeah it's a really important question i think and um we don't have lots of time left, uh, but maybe we can squeeze in um, one or two more questions here. Um, the question, the next question is how to deal with blisters from barefoot walking. Currently went on my first barefoot walk and the skin at the ball of my foot is tender. Uh, I would like some tips for that. Just Gold. keep doing it. Yeah, <laughs> Golden, what do, you, what do you got for this? Uh, I, I mean, it, my personal opinion is it, if you're getting blister, you're doing too much. Uh, so, you, so you might back off uh, or hold at that point until your feet can handle it. Uh, you can't put, uh, you know, any number of things over that. If you are determined to keep walking, duct tape works really well over a blister. <laughs> um, if, if, if the abrasion is just going to keep happening and, and you're just going to keep out there hammering it, um, you know, if, if you don't want to back off, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, you know, I always tell people like you, you want to go to a point where you're pushing it, but you're not going over the edge. Meaning, you know, you might get to the point where you're starting to get a blister, but that's where you stop. You know, if you're getting a blister, that's probably too much. It's more than your skin is ready to handle right now. So back off, hang out at that point for a week or two, and then slowly increase from there. And, and again, I always tell people, if you're starting from base one, I said it before, start with 30 seconds, add 30 seconds every few days. At some point, you're going to get to a point where it's like, okay, I might be pushing it too much. Hang out for there for a week or two, and then resume adding 30 seconds every few days. Um, you know, and that's that's for outdoor kind of more aggressive walking. You know, obviously you you can do a lot more than that around a carpeted house or just hanging out in the grass or whatever. So, yeah, the texture, simple. the 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 ground the ground that you walk on obviously matters here. It's not. I I have an assumption here that this is someone who walks on pavement. Um, and yeah, I've had lots and lots of blisters on this journey. And the one thing that, that I always look at is has like, have I gone all the way through the entire skin layer? And if I haven't, then I don't really worry about it too much. Right. I, obviously like, <laughs> yeah, maybe I've done a little too much and, and I, I have to check in with myself about, about how much I'm doing versus how ready my feet are to handle it. Um, but the, one of the, one of the big things that, that I talk about in my, in my work is that until you, until you like go over the line, you'll never know the line. Right. So, so this will happen and, and, you know, it's okay. And it's a signal that, okay, maybe you've gone a little bit over the line next time, try a little bit, a little bit less. And, and obviously that line's going to move over time. So yeah, yeah the body adapts. Yeah, it's a game, right? It's like an exper a constant experiment that that needs to be done and um, taking care of it at the moment. I mean, just maybe give it a little kiss and show us some love and say thank you to your feet for for being so amazing. Put some shoes on that keep your foot in its natural position. <laughs> <laughs> but also check that you're not doing some sort of compensatory movement as well. Yeah. Right? Like. There's definitely when you go from shoes to, to barefoot, like there is a, a period of time where your skin will need to toughen up if you're not used to that. But what also can happen is if, you know, say you have a bit of a restricted ankle range or be toe range or your hips, you know, not moving as well, you can get these little compensatory movements where you might, you know, twist off the foot instead of driving off the foot. You might roll off the big toe. They're, it could be something so you're doing that's actually causing a friction point based on the way you're walking. So if it keeps happening, then like a gait assessment or, you know, you could even do a simple gait assessment yourself, video yourself walking barefoot and just look for any kind of, you know, if you know where the blisters keep coming, look if there's something you're doing where you're actually twisting off that point and causing a friction spot. And if you are, then you either try and deal with that and work through, you know, the, the, working out why you're doing it or yeah. yeah seek help and get someone to really help you know get to that underlying problem and, and help you get on top of that compensation that you're doing yeah having coaches and guides is is such an important tool that we all have access to and don't use enough i think and you know at this yeah and you know like 
just you know you if you slow down your speed you'll those those things will go and and it's it to me the treatment is just walk more barefoot and so that you're in or in natural positions like like uh like you all keep um saying and 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 you know you got to regrow the foundation you got to start over because yeah you know i i can only speak for myself i spent 20 you know i don't you know maybe i didn't wear shoes when i was born but like 25 years probably wearing terrible footwear so it's you know i can't expect to have it fixed in even a month or even a year um totally back to to natural so so i think that's all the time we got there's a lot more questions and um i'd love to keep digging in but it seems like um we've hit the 45 minute mark you started and, late let's do one more <laughs> all right one more uh okay i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of cherry pick or one that i really like here um <laughs> Mm. okay uh, well i guess this one there's a really open-ended question here i'm gonna go for it um it's the the question is barefoot training for athletes question mark yes <laughs> uh, is this multiple choices <laughs> it, it's uh, yeah it's 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 multiple choice and there are infinite choices so so i'm guessing that's a question as to is barefoot training for athletes a good idea um is it and like what are what's what maybe what you've what what you've experienced with it what what has worked what hasn't worked well i think barefoot training for athletes is huge right and i get the question all the time around like I snowboard a lot here in winter. That's just what me and my family do. And a lot of my friends and family find it hard to grasp that, you know, I, I'm in a snowboard boot there, obviously. And they find it hard to understand how the barefoot training I do actually helps with the snowboarding side of things. So I think regardless of what shoe you need to wear for your sport, if that's why you're questioning barefoot training, obviously if you're, surfing or doing some sort of sport like gymnastics where you don't need shoes and you're kind of already barefoot training in a way but for sports where you do wear a shoe there are so many benefits to having your feet connected to your body and your brain um, having the muscles strong because even in a shoe or a boot i find even in the snowboard boot they're still not an ideal footwear they kill my feet but I've noticed over the years with barefoot training, the connection I have to my feet, it stays strong and it stays active even in that crappy boot now. Um, whereas I'll get my big toe engaging through turns, I'll drive off my feet just so much better than when I, you know, years ago I used to have orthotics in my boots and all the gear. And I feel that much better now, that much more balanced. Um, and I see that with athletes all the time, you know, from football to soccer, that, they're more responsive, you know, they tend to be way more connected. So less chance of, you know, injuries and those niggly kind of things that come along. So I think barefoot training is a, it's a no brainer for athletes. It protects your body. Yeah. It, it, it would appear to me that every athlete uses their foot um, except maybe like chess players or something like that. Um, oh, they still might be using it. <laughs> Yeah, tapping tapping the ground that connection as they reach and now they're really pushing off that big toe to reach that piece <laughs> <laughs> you never know it could be a game changer so yeah I, I mean i'm obviously a running coach i coach coach people uh you know all kinds of runners uh you know and a lot of trail runners uh as well and obviously barefoot's not really uh you know, going to be a main part of training for a, you know, high level mountain runner, putting a ton of miles on super rocky terrain, uh, you know, protection is speed or and co confidence and confidence is speed. Uh, with that said, like, uh, I, I encourage everybody to do some barefoot, um, you know, at least a, a few times a week, get some barefoot in, uh, ideally at the beginning or end of every run, take the shoes off and, 
um, you know, go from there. And then of course, I obviously encourage people to wear shoes that keep your foot in its barefoot natural position, regardless of whatever level of support or uh, protection or cushioning or whatever they happen to need for their given situation. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, to echo what Paul's saying, you know, any athlete is gonna benefit massively uh, by the, you know, connection, the strength, um, the coordination, the balance, the agility, uh, et cetera, that they're going to gain from doing some barefoot training. And so, um, you know, you may not be able to do the bulk of your training barefoot, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't supplement your training with barefoot mm -hmm. and everyone should, uh, because it's going to make you more dynamic, more explosive, uh, more agile, uh, just better at what you do period. And, you know, I, I hope someday we have natural footwear for sports. You know, there, there aren't basketball shoes that allow your foot to stay in its natural position or football cleats, for example. And you just look at these athletes and how mangled their feet are. Look at almost every NBA, you know, player, uh, NFL player. You know, these guys are ripping their shoes off the second the game's over in NFL games, um, college football players, et cetera. Uh, and NBA players just have mangled feet. Uh, it, it's a bad, you know, it's a, it's a bad, bad deal. And, and someday, you know, not only will they be supplementing with barefoot training, but all the incredible amount of uh, foot problems that we see in professional sports, uh, you know, tennis is another one. It seems like you can't get through a, you know, full length tennis match without an injury timeout to treat the feet. Mm -hmm. um, someday we'll have natural footwear for these people. And that will be a thing of the past. It will go away. Those injuries will stop happening. Uh, and that's a day I look forward to and, and can't wait to, to see because we'll, we'll start to see even more amazing things out of these athletes. I think just quickly as well, be mindful that it does, I don't think you have to always train barefoot in your given sport. So like running through the trails, for instance, barefoot, you know, that's dangerous or it's not, you can't really do that. Then you can like Golden said, you can supplement it out. So it might be that you spend some of your, you know, training that's not on field or on the hill or whatever on like a MOBO board with correct toes on or going through different drills that work on that neuromuscular connection. So that then when you are out on the track, that connection's there, you've built that habit, you've built those movement patterns that that can be just as important. I, I normally talk about these movement patterns, like a supplement, um, Golden mentioned supplementing this stuff in before. And it's like food, you know, it's not for some people, right now having barefoot all the time isn't going to happen and that's okay like if that's what you need to do for your sport but you can still have it like a supplement you know get that into your body get that kind of movement nutrient in that still feeds your brain so then you'll use your feet in a better way through all different types of movement in day-to-day -day use it'll be more connected the muscles will be stronger you have more mobility you know all those great things we need to to keep us healthy and what about barefoot training just for life, right? You know, like if you're stepping off a curb and you might roll your foot or you're 65 and you're at risk of falling and cracking your hip, you know, the things, this type of barefoot training is, it's, yes, it improves performance, but also it's going to improve your life for the rest of your life and make you more likely to not be injured and to be able to do the things that you love and, and really anybody no matter what type of activity you're doing, even if it's just picking up your child or, or wanting to be able to pick up your grandchildren, you know, this is like, it's really, it's really life training. So. Mm -hmm. Preach sister, preach. <laughs> yeah, well, that, what, what comes up for me is first, you know, relating to what you said, Anya, that, you know, pro athletes, and this may be a controversial statement, they're, are not healthy. They're like, they're not going for health. That's not their job. Their job is to, you know, make money doing what they do. And there's a really big distinction there. Um, you know, I, I was, I, I'm here in, in Southern California and I was driving and I saw an ad for a gym that says train like a pro athlete. I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that really. <laughs> um, and, and then the other part is that, sneaker culture is so deeply intertwined with professional sports that it's you know it's sad to see all of these professional athletes walking around when they're not on the court when they're not practicing in the same garbage that they wear while they're playing 
And mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, what, what is the message that's being sent? What, what are, you know, it's, um, it's all kind of backwards. I actually had a chat a couple of years ago to one of the big sporting team over in the, in the States. One of the coaches had reached out to me about all the players that were getting injured. And that was a conversation we had. Like we couldn't change the football boots. We couldn't change some of the training they were doing because of all the complex coaches and stuff. And I'd said to him, like, you know, the, the players, they're taking probably 10, 15,000 steps a day just in day-to-day life. And when we started, like, digging in and looking at how these people walk around, like, the, the habits they were creating, the damage they were doing just from walking, the stress they were putting on their body just from walking day-to-day, then you load that player up on a field, you know, an hour or two a day and wonder why they're getting hurt. It's like, well, you're not setting them up to win anyway. Like, everything they're doing from the moment they get out of bed to the moment they play is damaging tissue and inflaming their body. Like they're going to get hurt. (laughs) So we started talking about just simple things that you can get the players to do to start to, you know, hopefully trying to start walking better and improving foot health off the field. Um, I haven't actually reached out. We might see what what happened there. Kind of forgot about that. (laughs) So, Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. It looks like, uh, yeah, we're 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 over time, even with the extension. And I'm um, just, yeah, this has been really fantastic, and and has exceeded my expectations of what this was gonna be. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful to 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 be on this journey with with you all, and to get to connect with you on a regular basis um to yeah to keep driving this forward and 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 just to have be able to have conversations with people who can who actually care to have these conversations um i guess we're a lot of us are going to be at the um outdoor retailer show in um in denver coming up in uh, august i think 10 to 12 so we'll a lot of us will be out there if you want to connect with us we'll be there on those days and um gonna be at the outdoor retailer show um showing off some of the healthy feet tools and um yeah any last last words bolden you're on mute i just put a plug in for uh resources uh if you're looking for shoes check out on anya's reviews.com uh, there's tons of uh, foot health articles and all kinds of good stuff on correctos.com. Uh, my website, goldenharper.net. Uh, I've got a lot of practical stuff, uh, running related foot health stuff there. Um, yeah, just if, if you need help. And uh, also, I think, you know, most of us do uh, consultations or coaching of some sort. Uh, so if, if you need more in depth, uh, you know, check us out. We're happy to help. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we're all we're all here to support all of you. So reach out to us. I think we're all on on uh, on the social media channels, and if not, reach out to the Healthy Feet Alliance and um, yeah, and ask for to get in touch with us. And I'm sure we'll all be happy to to connect and and keep the barefoot movement going. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Okay.